Shall I start right now? Yes, please. Everybody's in. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Muhammad Abdullah. I'm a GIS expert working at the FAO Regional Office for the Near East and North Africa, and I'll be moderating this technical session. Uh, first, let me share with you my screen, the agenda for today. Full screen. Okay, so can you see my screen right now? Yes. Okay, I would like to welcome you all to this session, which focuses on the outcomes of the FAO webinar series on remote sensing determination uh, of evapotranspiration, or we call it remote sensing ET. So this is our agenda for today. Uh, in fact, the webinar series was launched back in March 2021 with the objective of uh, updating and upgrading the knowledge regarding the current remote sensing determination using the most adopted algorithms and approaches and the latest advance. Uh, also, one of the objectives was to increase the capacity of water professionals in the assessment of remote sensing ET uncertainty and related acceptable limits for their field of application. The third objective was building awareness on the strengths and li limitation for the range of remote sensing models and databases available for application. Uh, today, we will start um, with an opening session for, um, after my introduction with, uh, with uh, uh, the, opening, the opening remarks of uh, Dr. Muhammad Al-Hamdi and then a keynote presentation for 40 minutes. Uh, the web, uh, then this will be followed by a panel discussion for 20 minutes, followed by questions and answers uh, from the audience, and finally the closing remarks. In fact, the remote sensing uh, uh, webinar series uh, uh, is, impl uh, is implemented within the framework of the Water Scarcity Initiative of the FAO Regional Office for the Near East and North Africa, with the support of the FAO WEPS Regional Project, that is funded by the Swedish International Development and Cooperation Agency. We are glad to have with us our distinguished guests whom I'll introduce in a in few minutes. But before we begin, I'll, I'll, I'd like to draw your attention that uh, the session will be recorded and you can submit your questions through the chat box, which will be available in a few minutes. And then you can use the globe icon to switch between Arabic, English, and French. And please, in order to make it easy for us, in order to identify the questions within the chat box, I kindly ask you to, when you submit a question in the chat box, that you uh, follow the format I'm just pasting in, uh, in the chat box. Um, now I'll give the, the, the floor for the opening remarks to Dr. Muhammad Al-Hamdi. Dr. Muhammad Al-Hamdi is the senior land and water officer at the FAO Regional Office for the Near East and North Africa, and the Delivery Manager of the Regional Water Scarce Initiative. He is the chair of this session. So, Dr. Hamdi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mohammed, and good morning, everyone. Dear participants, dear colleagues, distinguished guests, good morning to all of you. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the technical session on the remote sensing determination of evapotranspiration outcomes from the FAO webinar series, which is being held uh, along or within the, uh, the sessions of the Cairo Water Week 2021. The webinar series uh, stems from a number of evolving drivers. Among these drivers, there is the fast growing digitalization process of FAO in providing big data and spatial databases, including natural resources and infrastructural assets easily accessible to the member countries. The process indicated as the hand in hand initiative within FAO is expected to accelerate the identification of critical knowledge gaps, best practices and investment requirements in order to proceed towards an optimal plan, planning and implementation of effective action plans leading to achievements of the SDG in the least possible time. An additional driver is the establishment of the FAO and uh, inter-regional inter technical platform on water scarcity to join the wealth of knowledge and technical resources of the five regions of FAO, 
from the Near East and North Africa to Latin America, to Asia, to Africa, and then also to Europe. The platform will represent a digital asset, providing information and enabling dialogue exchange between experts and stakeholders like governments, farmer organizations, uh, funding agencies, researchers, private sector, civil society organizations, uh, etc. To share their knowledge, success stories, lessons learned, perspectives, and experiences. The platform will focus on dissemination of regional, national, and subnational successful innovations, promising ideas and best practices to cope with water scarcity. Also, in this case, the ultimate goal is to accelerate the SDG implementation. We are proud that our FAO regional office in Cairo, in the Near East and North Africa, has been assigned to lead such uh, inter-regional technical platform on water scarcity, as this assignment represents the recognition of the success achieved by the water scarcity initiative in the NENA region, a success achieved thanks to the significant contribution of all our partners on uh, of the water scarcity initiative. The third driver of the webinar series on remote sensing determination of evapotranspiration is the advances in space science, in bioclimatology, and in atmospheric boundary layer modeling. Combined by the pressing need to carry out reliable water accounting and water allocation strategies towards sustainable water resources management, particularly in water scarce regions like ours, projected to further be affected by climate change. In order to, to develop strategic planning of water resources management, particularly over large areas, there is no question that remote sensing represents the way forward. And there is no question that evapotranspiration represents the largest share of water by agriculture in our region, up to and beyond 80%. And it, it is a strong binding constraint to water resources sustainability. We'll hear today some of the outcomes of this webinar series, and we invite you to participate also in the, in the next technical session, uh, 5.4, that will be uh, following this, uh, this session after the coffee break, dedicated to field measurements of evapotranspiration and necess uh, necessary ground verification of satellite data. This session is organized through FAO ICARDA partnership. Last but not least, I would like to thank everyone who has contributed and participated in the webinar series. And special thanks to my colleague, Pasquale Istituto, who uh, is the initiator of the idea and has been instrumental in transforming the idea, the idea into reality. Without further ado, I thank you for your participation uh, and also for your attention. Thank you, back to you, Muhammad. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hamdi, for highlighting the regional technical platform and the ET network session that will be following this session. Uh, now we'll move to our keynote presentation by Dr. Studutu. Dr. Kaspali Studutu holds a master's degree in water science and a PhD in soil plant water relationships from the University of California in Davis. He's, he has been working for more than 30 years on agricultural water use efficiency water productivity with a focus on uh, crop water requirement and consumption. Uh, the real response to water and associate modeling development under water scarcity conditions. His scientific and technical activities have been coupled with the management of many water related development projects in several regions around the world. Mr. Studuto worked for FAO serving as chief of the water service as the regional program coordinator for the Near East and North Africa, and as a delivery manager of the Water Scarce Initiative. He also served as an advisory member in several international committees and boards. Mr. Studuto is currently an independent senior water advisor, and for the year 2020, he has been ranked among the top 1% world's highly cited researchers in the web of science. Mr. Studuto, the floor is yours. Please kindly, I'd like to kindly ask you to share your presentation and start the uh, your presentation, please. Thank you. Shukran, Mohammed. Uh, thank you very much, Sabal Kir, everybody. Um, 
it is always a pleasure to be here at the Cairo Water Week. Can you see my screen and can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, today, yes, I will try to provide you an overview of this uh, webinar series and possibly abstract some major uh, outcome. The, um, oops, sorry. Major outcome of this uh, 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 series of uh, webinars on remote sensing determination on, of evapotranspiration. Uh, let me first uh, provide you soon upfront what are the useful links to which you may refer to in order to have a background and more information on the program of these webinars at the FAO uh, web link, as well as the link of the D group on water account in where you can uh, find the recording of the webinars, uh, copies of the presentation, and suggested reading. Um, because this presentation will be held into the uh, Cairo Water Week uh, uh, recording, you can go back to this for further detail that eventually will not be possible to present here during this uh, presentation. Let me provide first a, a little background in order to have everybody on the same page. We all know that evapotranspiration is a key variable of the water cycles and represents nearly always the largest share of water outflow from agriculture and other vegetated lands and is important to monitor and to quantify for several reasons, including irrigation, crop water productivity, prediction of yield, uh, assessment of some drought indexes, most important also for performing water accounting and water balance. So that is relevant in a way for uh, the strategic water resource management. However, one of the challenges we have with evapotranspiration is its quantification, because it's regulated by complex land-plant atmosphere interaction, mostly driven by climate and weather, but also influenced by wind pattern, topography, soil moisture, and vegetation type. So how to quantify ET over the time that has been mostly field measurement, uh, like a lysimeter, uh, micrometeorological methods, uh, uh, scintillometers, and so on, that, however, are very local in scale, uh, sometimes even point source. So the major problem is the scaling uh, up of those methods, which becomes prohibitive when you want to go uh, very large. Therefore, for large coverage, the only way to go is through remote sensing. And we have observed that the progress and advances in Earth observation over recent years, plus the evolution of the algorithm to measure ET, gave results a substantial increase in attention to measure uh, ET via remote sensing, and at the same time, to start to provide several database and portals freely available to the public. However, this increase in, in expansion of ET determination via remote sensing and the availability of several databases, also the user concern were increasingly mounting. And basically they were concerned about how to assess proper spatial and temporal resolution for given application, what is the strength, the weakness, the fit for purpose of the variable remote sensing models, uh, how to deal with accuracy uh, determination of this data, and how to conduct some sort of error analysis, or what are the modality to testing the remote sensing ET with the field measurement. But therefore, the FAO Water Scarcity Initiative of the NENA region, with the support of the SIDA project, has elaborated a plan of webinars to address this user's concern. 
and possibly updating the knowledge and upgrading the uh, information and publication on the subject. So let me provide just a briefing on the webinars that have been presented so far. One module was dedicated to the various models. We have Sebal, Metric, Alexi, is Alexi, the CBOB, the Simplified energy Surface Energy Balance, the Prezi Taylor equation elaborated by the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab of NASA. Then we had ET Loop, ET Monitor, ET Watch. All these models representing the most, uh, let's say, advanced uh, modeling uh, realm of the uh, remote sensing for evapotranspiration have been presented by their um, uh, authors and developers, as you can see from, from the name. Um, a second module was dedicated to the database enforcers, and we had the VAPOR, the FAO Water Productivity Open Access Portal with data from ETLU. Then we have the Global Daily ET, GLODET, with data from Alexi and this Alexi. Earth Engine ET Flux, uh, with data from Metric. And then the Fuse Network, the Farmine Early Warning System, with data mostly from CEBO. Um, two major applications were presented in uh, irrigation, particularly the SIMS, the Satellite Irrigation Management Support System by Forest Mountain. And then EriWatch by Wim Bastianse that is with us today and will be a part of the panel uh, discussion. Um, then a third model was dedicated to the prospect for the near future. We had the presentation of the OpenET. OpenET is a platform that joined several of the remote sensing ET model and has been officially launched by NASA just one week ago, last Thursday. Then we heard about the Copernicus uh, uh, Earth Observation Program of the European Union, some of the major modeling application with this Copernicus data, and then the new phase of VAPOR, VAPOR phase, phase two with the uh, major advance and what would be the next step uh, to be involved. Um, then the last module is the one that has been planned to, to be dedicated to the remote sensing key errors and comparison with the field data. Uh, here, the, this module become quite complex and difficult to deal with. However, we had some comparison between remote sensing field data on Palmyra Oasis in Syria. Then we had some comparison with the lysimeters in Jordan, and still uh, to be done, the, the series, in fact, of webinars will end early December. We are still to go with one multiple comparison uh, between among the country of the region between remote sensing and field determination, which will be provided by uh, Chandra Biradar of ICARDA. I will try to address myself one webinar on uncertainty by discussing and highlighting some of the issue and then provide some reflection. Um, Rick Allen and Isaac Ilich, the, the authors of Metric, will talk about CMET, the calibration using inverse modeling of extreme condition to mitigate uncertainty and bias in a satellite-based uh, energy balance component. Finally, we will close the webinar series with the last uh, presentation by Joshua Fisher on the future of evapotranspiration. Uh, let's look then to the outcome now of the webinar. First, um, on a stay, we were trying to categorize the different models according to some criteria. And uh, for instance, we had uh, a criteria based on core algorithm. Uh, there is the surface energy balance, uh, strictly speaking, because all model in some way, uh, at some point or another, uh, exercise the surface energy balance. But these are the core of the real 
and gene of the mole. So uh, some are based on surface area balance, measuring the balance surface temperature. Some are based on Penman motif. Uh, one particularly is based on psychrometry analogy, and one is based on Pritzsche Taylor equation. Um, we can distinguish also on the base if model are one source or two source. Uh, depending if the model considered the surface as one single layer of exchange of energy and matter with the atmosphere, or if it separated the vegetated surface from uh, the uh, bare soil surface. And then also we can uh, group them in based on the spatial resolution and uh, coverage. But, uh, in any case, the various uh, models may fall in more than one category. And often they adopt a mix of approaches, various remote sensing data sources and data feature in order to achieve less return. So this is an arbitrary, let's say, categorization of the various models. Just to, to briefly bring to uh, what are the one that belong to this category, we have that for the surface energy balance, we have Sebal, Metric, and Alexi, where they use the energy balance in which the latent heat of evaporation, Le, that represents the energy uh, expression of evapotranspiration, is the difference between the nectar radiation, the soil heat flux, and the sensible heat flux. And we have to re remind uh, ourselves that these are generally one dimensional um, type of exchange, which means uh, are vertical uh, mainly. So we need to, to solve this energy balance equation. We need to have these three components, starting with the net radiation, which is the uh, difference between all incoming short and long wave radiation minus all outgoing short and, uh, and uh, uh, long wave radiation. The point here is that the satellite is in the extraterrestrial space. And in order to get the net radiation at the surface, it has to cross the whole atmosphere. And here is where we have a, sort, a source of uncertainty. Basically, spatial difference in clouds, aerosols, dust, and smoke contamination affect the uncertainty of net uh, radiation. The soil heat flux is generally presented as a fraction of net radiation and is a function of the land surface temperature, the reflection or video of the shortwave radiation, and the coverage of vegetation. Generally, a few empirical equations have been developed and locally calibrated, but most of the time, or some of the time, it is required to verify that those equations are valid also in other locations. Uh, but uh, what is the most critical um, energy flux to solve is the sensible heat flux. The sensible heat flux, according to the flux gradient theory, is generally expressed in simple term as the directly proportional to the gradient in temperature and inversely proportional to the resist resistance, the aerodynamic resistance. Uh, delta P, in fact, is the difference between the so-called aerodynamic temperature of the surface and the air temperature some height above the surface. But satellites, measure the radiometric temperature and not the aerodynamic temperature and cannot derive directly air temperature. So Sebane metric overcome the problem of inferring this uh, uh, aerodynamic temperature and air temperature by directly estimating the temperature difference between two uh, height so that the, the uh, delta T, the gradient, is expressed by a linear relationship uh, with the, uh, oops, wait. a linear relationship um, with the surface temperature. This is a, is, has been 
at the breakthrough provided by Bastianz and already in 1995 or earlier, and has been demonstrated to be a very solid uh, relationship. So A and B represent the simple the intercept at the slope, and PS dot is just the uh, surface temperature, the radiometric temperature determined by satellite adjusted to a common elevation because we know that temperature also uh, change with elevation. Um, the point is that A and B are two unknown in one equation. And so to, uh, to solve delta T, two extreme non conditional identified in the image, the so-called hot or dry peaks, where basically being dry, the latent heat is essentially zero, and the other extreme is the cold or wet pixel, where essentially all the available energy is going in evaporation, so that the sensible heat is about at zero. The criteria to select cold and hot pixel, either based on the operator experience or through automated algorithms, a source also of uncertainty. Alexi has a different computing approach for age by the, the, uh, relating the rise in air temperature in the mixer layer to the time integrated influx of sensible heat into the atmospheric boundary layer. This is a little bit more complex to explain, but essentially two measures in the morning are of temperature are taken and the rise in air temperature depends on the influx of the sensible heat into the atmospheric boundary a layer. However, we still need to solve for dynamic system, which is affected by wind patterns, atmospheric stability, a surface roughness. The wind patterns, speed and profile is very much influenced by terrain topography and elevation. So the complexity of our surface play a role in the determination of that dynamic system. The same is the atmospheric stability depends on the balance between buoyancy and mechanical forces that increase the, uh, or decrease the aerodynamic resistance. And finally, the surface roughness depends on crop height and architecture. So we can think of uniform crop, row crop, tree crops that influence also the aerodynamic resistance. And without entering now in the detail is enough to know that different solutions exist based on numerical method to solve for this variable. What is important to retain here is the variable complexity behind in order to derive an accurate uh, value of this aerodynamic system. One aspect that need to be considered that generally the remote sensing provides instantaneous determination of the day of the satellite of the pass, although we have seen that Alexi used two uh, time of the day. Um, however, the snapshot duration of the satellite is of the order of one seventh of a second. And then uh, while the geostationary uh, data can give a five to 30 minute average, although their uh, resolution, ground spatial resolution is never less than two kilometers. So how to go from instantaneous to daily integration? There is one way to go is to derive the so-called evaporative ratio, which um, is considered to be constant that, uh, over the day so that uh, when we integrate over the day the available energy, we can get early by using the, this ratio determined at the time of the snapshot. Um, this is used both by Sebal and Alexi, while the fluorescent metric used the fraction of evapotranspiration, uh, actual evapot or crop evapotranspiration to reference evapotranspiration. This is the, uh, let's say the green dots represent what is the uh, variation during the day that can be considered about constant. So, but the point here is that uh, generally reference evapotranspiration 
represent a good reality check for the daytime integration and also for the interpolation between satellite overpass. We said that there are also uh, models based on thermal T uh, equation, and this is because on the surface energy balance model, there is the requirement of dealing with the cloud-free image in order to have accurate land surface temperature. So to circumvent this problem, model based on permanent equation have been developed. And although different gap filling technique also have been developed, um, it, it based mostly on available model function. It look and it monitor are based on the permanent equation that you see here. Um, Generally, the loop uses the standard permanent equation. It monitor uses a modified version uh, of permanent heat. It's called the Shuttleworth Wallace equation. Often, microwave radiometry is used to provide the surface soil moisture information. And this, uh, because the microwave can detect the soil moisture of the first couple of centimeters or so, depending on the soil characteristic, but uh, this uh, soil surface is used to, um, soil surface moisture is used to compute evaporation from their soil, and then an additional parameterization is introduced to compute the subsoil moisture, the one interest to the root zone in order to determine transpiration. It the monitor used sometimes also synthetic aperture radar to derive the Roughness. And uh, the point here that probably we need to consider is there is a trade off. Unfortunately, the presence of the clouds induced to, to develop a different model, but to, to avoid certain computation uh, during, the, uh, during the cloud uh, situation, we need to introduce new parameterization. And this increases the complexity, as we will see later. In fact, just to give you an example, the parameterization of the canopy surface resistance require a knowledge on the minimum stomata resistance, temperature stress factor, vapor pressure stress factor, short wave radiation stress factor, soil monster stress factor, and so on. So these are all multiplicative factors that are in the enter into play and that require some uh, valid calibration, validation, etc. Model can be also a combination of Penman and the surface energy balance. And we have one ET Watch, which uh, makes use of multi source satellite data, including radar for soil monster, to derive key land and meteorological variables. Without entering in too many details, just to Simply, when we look at the flowchart of ET Watch, you can see that it starts by using surface energy budget, like Sebal, from which he derives, he derives the evapotranspiration under clear sky days. Then he reverses the permanent equation to derive some surface resistance under clear sky. Then he introduced the parameterization for soil and monster to derive always through permanent heat the evaluable transpiration through cloud in cloudy days. ET Watch adopts a rather elaborate parameterization of the model based on actual local condition and multi source satellite with multi data fusion is one of the most complex models, although it pays very much attention to local calibration. Uh, there is one model, the uh, CBOB, the Simplified Surface Energy Balance Operation, that is based on satellite psychrometric approach. Here is very, the idea is very simple. We know from psychometry that we measure dry bulb and wet bulb to derive the actual uh, vapor pressure of the atmosphere as a difference between the saturated vapor pressure minus a psychrometric constant multiplied by the difference in temperature, dry bulb and wet bulb, so that you can derive also relative humidity as a ratio of the actual vapor pressure and, and uh, saturated vapor pressure. So CBOP 
develop an analogy where in this case, the fraction of the ratio between actual evapotranspiration and reference evapotranspiration is equal one minus a so-called surface uh, psychrometric constant for uh, times the difference between the satellite measurement uh, of the, any pixel in the image minus the surface temperature only of the cold uh, pixel. So by substituting this uh, surface uh, psychrometric constant that is the uh, is the inverse of the difference between the temperature of the hot pixel minus the temperature of the co cold pixel, you derive the, this fraction. Then you need, of course, the ETO in order to get the actual evapotranspiration. Just to visualize, you can see, for instance, over transect. This case of different kilometer, you have that the black line is the surface temperature of the cold pixel. The red line is the surface temperature of the hot pixels. And the yellow line is the temperature of the actual surface of each pixel of the image. It's a very simple in conceptualization, uh, although it has been sometimes criticized for certain uh, solution uh, that he adopted to derive this different uh, uh, variable uh, for the equation of the, the ET fraction. Then there is one model based on Prince Taylor uh, equation. This has been uh, developed in the Jet Propulsion Lab of the NASA. Uh, essentially at the core, there is the equation of Prince Taylor which represents the equilibrium evaporation by, multiplied by a constant alpha. These are all essentially known variable or easy to drive. The only thing you need is net radiation. However, the Prissy Taylor provided the potential. We need to have the actual. To reduce the potential to actual, this model um, use four ecophysiological constraint function also then multiplicative and use the uh, unit less that the, go, uh, the factor goes from zero to one. So we have a relative surface wetness, a green fraction of the canopy that is actively transpiring, a plant temperature constraints, uh, and then a plant moisture constraint. So that the model separated the three source, soil, canopy, and intercepted, um, water and uh, each one, each component is a pretty Taylor equation multiplied by the pertinent uh, constraint function. Uh, we said that you can also have uh, one source toward two source model. And uh, in this case, Sebald metric and Sebald are one source. Alexi, pretty Taylor, it looks, it looks and ET watch are two source models. And uh, the point here is that when you go from one to two source, all the equation double. You will need to have a net radiation for soil and net radiation for canopy, a sensible heat for soil and sensible heat for canopy, a latent heat for soil and so on. So in the same, the permanent heat for uh, canopy and for soil. So the point is that the complexity of one source model is about to double when you pass to two source model. Now talking about complexity, at the beginning of the uh, webinar series, we indicated that there is a relationship between the uncertainty of the model and the model complexity, which is represented by its structure and parameters. In other words, if we look at the conceptual structure, a very simple model, um, not capturing the, the, the core phenomenon of the reality may be high in uncertainty. As you incorporate more and more elements that better reflect the reality, you reduce the uncertainty. You never reach zero, eh? uncertainty, because it's a model, is a, a, a simplification of the reality, it's never a replica. The point, however, remains that as we increase the, the, the structure to the conceptual structure to capture more reality, 
We also need more parameterization. So the number of parameters increase, and in this case, the uncertainty increase with the parameter, which means we have a trade-off here, where to stop in terms of complexity of conceptual structure and number of parameters. Here, we have tried to rank, in fact, the different models presented at the webinars uh, according to their complexity. And we came out with this uh, order, let's say, CBOB is considered on the least complex, let's say, followed by Sabonimetri, followed by Alexi and uh, Chrissy Taylor, followed by eating monitor look, and the most complex is uh, uh, most likely ET watch. Each of these models has a spatial and temporal scale also. Generally speaking, we are in between uh, a daily and decadal uh, time scale, considering anyway that the Sebal and Metric, the user, uh, the Landsat might have daily, but every eight or 16 days. In terms of uh, spatial scale, except if the monitor that has remaining one kilometer, so applied mostly for larger scale, the others can go down to 100 meter or 30 meter, 70 meter, and so on. Sometimes if you watch claim to go even below, but it's not clear how. Um, then we have the so-called best fit for this. One question is which model I should use for my application? And what is the application? What are the purpose of using uh, uh, the remote sensing if you know? So we came out for the time being at least with the, um, uh, this list of purpose, for instance, annual water basin, balance, national and basic level, inter-basing allocation, compliance with water transfer agreement, groundwater consumption, irrigation district allocation, crop water consumption, which are, these are seasonal or on-farm um, irrigation that goes down in terms of a time scale. And here, what are the models that best fit is not easy to respond, but generally speaking, we see that for large scale and for long term, more or less each one can respond, but a different level of efficiency in, in the processing. At the irrigation district, we have the PC Taylor and the simplified surface energy balance, or also the surface energy balance. And, uh, crop water consumption, we go, uh, you know, to, to lower uh, surface area balance, Prissy Taylor, Pernamontite, TT Watch, and on farm, mostly surface energy balance, either simplified or not, and Prissy Taylor. Essentially, for feed purpose, uh, for purpose, we consider that for poor spatial resolution, Pernamontite, Prissy Taylor, Psychometric approach, Alexi may be better off. For fine spatial resolution, maybe the surface energy balance may be better off. And for cloudy condition, permanently, if you watch an Alexi, may be better off. Now, why I'm putting this emphasis on may be better off is because the fast evolution of models and the augmentation of new satellite data is allowing that each model may fit multiple purposes. Uncertain. Here is a, is a, a very difficult uh, subject to give when we uh, wanted to, to analyze a remote sensing about transpiration for different reasons. First of all, there is an uncertainty that is acceptable according to the use. I make a waste example that if you sell or buy gold, you need a scale that is accurate at least to the milligram. But if you go to the farmer's market and you buy fruit, you may go okay with the 100 gram answer. So the same purpose that we have seen before, uh, the annual water balance, interbasin allocation, and so on, might have this 
inherent acceptability of uncertainty. The annual balance between five and 10, the same for uh, interbasic allocation. But for instance, we have been observing that the uh, water transfer agreement requires a much stricter uh, acceptability. Groundwater, maybe 10, but some they want a very uh, high accuracy and the same for seasonal irrigation, district allocation and crop water consumption. For on-farm where the, the time scale is variable, we have a better feeling of a much error, you know, uncertainty we can accept. One millimeter per day, three to five millimeter per week, or five to 15 millimeter per month, or 50 maximum 100 millimeter. The point is that we are not very confident with all this accepted because it's not easy, depends on scale, depends on the amount, depends on several boundary conditions. Just to tell you one anecdote, when a water minister saw that we can have an uncertainty of 10%, he stood up in the audience and said, wait a minute, my national water reserves uh, uh, my national water resource, 10% of them goes to supply water to the urban sector. How can I have 10% error? Means I may or I may not supply water to my urban sector. So it's a way to indicate how difficult it is also to identify. But this is something that requires much more work. Uh, we are, let's say, much more confident on on farm So. There are several uh, things that needs to be done. Now, when we look at which model can better uh, guarantee, let's say, the, or match the acceptable uncertainty. So what is the expected uncertainty from the model? It's difficult to reply. Each model uh, have demonstrated that can go in that uh, accuracy level, but in several other cases, they don't. So it's a very difficult, still open question, yeah, still to work on. Uh, local calibration play a role, uh, sensitivity of the model plays a role. Who is running the uh, remote sensing model plays a role. And so a search is still ongoing on the actual and expected answer in remote sensing. All of the model generally use the network of clocks tower that monitor continues the energy and mass exchange um, between surface and atmosphere. And here is just to tell you, look what we have in North Africa and Near East, basically nothing. And this is why FAO and ICARDA have joined, um, uh, let's say forces in order to establish a network of uh, institution and country that can, uh, you use uh, the same protocol to provide a field measurement um, of ET data. Uh, some uh, uh, tests that have been done, this from the open ET uh, models uh, against the eddy covariance. Here you can see in the green bar is the reference, and you can see how the different uh, models have performed. One that I would, one thing I would like to highlight is this is related to 32 years and uh, what is presented is the annual uh, uh, value. And also you can see that metric, is Alexi, they perform well, but they were more complex than CBOB that also performs well. Just to tell you that not necessarily sophistication is the answer to increase accuracy. This doesn't mean that all the time they would all perform the same. The, another um, presentation showed the performance of, for instance, in this case of ET look, and you can say that also here we are talking per year, and also observe Alexi and observe CBOB. So different type of model may perform differently, um, depending on the condition that now we would. Uh, Summarize. Uh, one more uh, test was about the comparing, for instance, the surface energy balance over the uh, permanent model, like the ET loop. 
uh, for different crops. Uh, and in this case, we are talking of millimeter per day. And you can see here, for instance, that there is an underestimation uh, by Etilok, but we have observed also overestimation. So how to go about it is that, uh, well, the accuracy tends to decrease going from annual to monthly to daily basis. So the shorter the time scale, the higher it they generate the inaccuracy. The accuracy also tends to decrease going from smooth, uniform field crops to orchard. So we, what we observe is a variability of uncertainty results in this comparison, depending on time scale, calibration of parameters, local advantage condition, and model sensitivity, et cetera. So let's try to conclude. Uh, this is quite intense uh, amount of information, but essentially the application of resource sensing is accelerated, particularly in water resource management, because advance in technology, knowledge, satellite, and so on. But despite this uh, significant advance in ET science, we still have a knowledge gap in hydrological and climatologic, climatological dynamics. So the new satellite mission and the new remote sensing form are coming into play to fill this gap. We heard about Copernicus uh, from EU, the EcoStress from NASA. There will be a plan for 2000. Uh, 24 to uh, launch another constellation of uh, a satellite called Hydrosat and so on. So also we have available several open uh, access database and portal of high value for several applications. Remember Vapor, GlobalT, FuseNet, Flux. But the key aspect remains the understanding of data uncertainty. We need to be aware of what are the certainty of the data we are using in order to better manage the risks we have to face when taking decision in a broad range of water resource management application and operation. Among them, I would like to remind um, the spatial difference in cloud aerosol, does the smoke uh, contamination affecting net radiation, the non-uniformity of the underlying surface affecting roughness, the atmospheric stable and unstable condition affecting the aerodynamic resistance, the insufficient spatial representation of sun meteorological value, wind, for example, uh, for, for example and uh, saturation, uh, the actual uh, water pressure of the atmosphere affecting aerodynamic and surface resistances. And then uh, also, as I said, the fluctuating daily climatic conditions that affect the time integration. One aspect I would like also to highlight uh, is particularly important for our uh, region. We may have not just one dimension, we can have a lateral flow of exchange of energy, so advection or OSF. So we need to understand more about the flux, flux from footprint. In fact, we have in our region area of uh, a large area under irrigation and then surrounded by desert where this condition may be present. Of course, in addition to skill and understanding of operator and how much we calibrate the various model parameters. One thing can, came out clear is that the availability of field agrometeo station and reference evapotation, evapotation is relevant to reduce the uncertainty. One last slide is about where we are going, a snapshot into the future in terms of uh, spatial and temporal resolution. We are getting away from the low frequency, low spatial resolution of satellites, and we, have, we are moving uh, into the higher and a higher frequency and spatial resolution with hydrosat is expected to go even at the right uh, uh, quadrant. Uh, however, what we are aiming at is the high temporal resolution daily to sub daily, uh, the high spatial resolution toward 10 meters, and then the, the high accuracy T that should be significantly less than 10% relative error. So, one uh, slide about the statistics so far, we have 21. Webinars, uh, there are four more to go. We have already 85 countries from the world. 
with uh, over 4,000 voter registration and over 2,200 uh, participation. Of course, considering that the same person might have followed more than one uh, webinar. Uh, the registration is important because those people, even if they don't follow the live webinar, they can access to the old information, background, recording, and uh, presentation copy. In terms of gender share, we had 64% male, 36% female. The profile of the participant were dominated by researchers, but not just researchers of academia, but from National Research Center, uh, Ministry of Agriculture, and so on. Also, the consultants were uh, basically involved in project where ET, remote sensing of ET was uh, somehow uh, uh, involved. Um, in institutionally, as affiliation, you can see, in fact, the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, NARC, National Agriculture Research Center, uh, International Center for Agriculture Research, and so on. And I will stop here reminding only that this activity has been funded by the CEDA, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, and has been implemented by the FAO Water Scarcity Initiative. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. And sorry if I went over time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Studuto, for the interesting and informative presentation highlighting the different models used for determining ET from remote sensing and providing more clarity on the assessment of remote sensing ET uncertainty and acceptable limits for the different applications. Uh, I'm sure the audience have enjoyed the presentation and they have questions for you. I kindly ask the audience just to wait till the third section of uh, the webinar of the, of the technical session where you can ask your questions. Um, now I'll be moving to our next part of the session, the panel discussion. I'm glad to have with us distinguished guests in the field of remote sensing ET. I'll begin with uh, Dr. Wim Bastiansen. Dr. Wim Bastiansen is an irrigation and drainage engineer by training uh, from Van Hall Larenstein in, in the Netherlands and acquired his PhD from Wageningen University in soil physics and agrohydrology and groundwater management. Uh, Mr. Bastiansen is the original developer of the famous Sebal model that, in, that was introduced for computing consumptive use of irrigated areas in Spain and Egypt during 1991 and 1992, respectively. Sebal is now applied and tested in more than 60 irrigation countries. After several years of teaching at HD Delft, the Institute for Water Education, and providing training in several specialized courses around the world. He is currently the CEO and founder of ERIWATCH, a Dutch private sector company providing operational irrigation advisory services to smallholders and commercial farmers and agribusiness industry across the world. Uh, Dr. Wim, you are considered as a pioneer in the application of remote sensing for determination of ET. You've been contributing so much to this domain, and I'd say you have inspired and influenced so many other scientists around the world in entering into this remote sensing determination uh, uh, for ET. You've always looked at the application of remote sensing ET at farm level, water management. Uh, you started the Water Watch, and recently you established Eri Watch to guide farmers for sound and effective irrigation schedule. So my question to you, with your extensive experience in remote sensing application, what are the ingredients to achieve a successful applied system based on remote sensing in support of, in support of the on-farm water resources management? Dr. Wim, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mohammed, for uh, your question. And um, I should say that I want to thank, first of all, FAO of uh, summarizing 25 years of work. Very well done, Pasquale. Um, I think what is happening is that uh, you have very many parallel groups in the world working on this ET, and somebody has to bring it together. And I think you, uh, you have done that uh, very well. I'd like to recognize before I answer your question, Mohammed, that 
we have now better satellites than we had before and uh, hydrosat is coming other programs are coming so we have now better uh, data we also have good databases that, that we did not have before and we have now all the algorithms that were accidentally reviewed uh, by uh, by pasquale uh, including the validation and um, i really think feo has a very important role because FEO can, um, say, uh, formulate the demand on behalf of farmers in the world. And farmers will never do that. Farmer communities will not do that. FEO has to do it. So I think this is very, uh, very proper. The last and uh, next part from FEO is to go to the farmer. And um, my experience is that, um, yeah, we are all happy that finally we have this ET maps and then we get the frustration because farmers are not waiting for an ET map, you know. They really want more than that. They really want to get more like what to do in terms of how much water should I give, when should I irrigate and so on. So we should also work on the traject that comes after the uh, ET mapping. In many countries, farmers are conservative. That's a conservative community, and they will not believe immediately if there is a new um, um, product on ET on the market. So I think if we really want to, to reach out, it has to go through, um, let's say, uh, advisory services, existing consultants that farmers trust. Uh, uh, I, I just want to give one example that is, for instance, in Portugal, an, an, a product called My Irrigation. Uh, and people use it. People use it for a long time because they trust it. Okay. Why do they trust that? Because it's already there for a long time. It's already based on weather station information, on crop information, soil moisture. And now, if you then add on ET, then you have a much higher chance that they accept that uh, rather than you know, making them aware that there is new ET information. So, so this is one point that it, you know, it has to go through some third person that, that farmers are familiar with. Uh, and they need also guidance. It's not, my experience is that if you show these maps to farmers, you know, they have an, a difficulty in really interpreting. They know what ET is, but what does it mean in terms of action? So they need guidance and local consultants can really uh, do that, uh, that job very well. So this is one point, you know, that we should connect. Um, the other issue I want to mention is timing. Uh, um, irrigation, I'm really talking about irrigation here, uh, but irrigation is a very dynamic thing and um, the images should be there on time. So yesterday's image should be reaching farmers, you know, in the early morning today. You cannot wait one or two days, then it will be too late. And so timing is very important and the image should always be there, or at least the information should be there. Uh, you cannot say like, okay, sorry, uh, farmer X, there was no image yesterday. Then they will not use an, an ET-based remote sensing product. They will only use that if the data is always there. So really one of the big challenges is these clouds uh, and we really have to take care that even under clouded conditions, there is a solution. And also the farms are informed that the accuracy is going down uh, in case uh, there is a clouded uh, atmosphere uh, because the, the accuracy cannot be the same as uh, on days where you have a very uh, nice sunshine weather. So that is the, the, the timing issue. Um, third point I want to make, I just want to make four points. Um, the third one is that um, um, the mobile phone is very important. Most farmers manage the farm by their phone. And uh, portals are very nice. Portals are very nice for uh, advanced farmers. Uh, sometimes you have commercial farmers with different farms. So they really would like to compare different fields Then a portal or a platform is very nice. But my experience is, is that there should be one platform. If we come with another ET platform or remote sensing platform, they, they will not look. You have to connect to existing platforms that are already in the market. You know, they want to look on one dashboard, Every morning and breakfast, I want to see what is happening. So it has to be aligned with other data sources, with other existing, say, uh, platforms. That is also one thing. And the last thing, Mohammed, um, on how can we really connect to farmers is that um, there should always be um, an, an economic benefit. 
And the implication is that the service that is going to be provided via consultants to farmers has to have a low price. They are not going to pay, you know, an, a large amount of money that is uh, sometimes needed for cost recovery. So it has to be cheap, number one. And number two, there should be a link to production. It has to solve something for the farmer, you know, and solving his irrigation schedule is very nice, of course, because then you can save water, you can save energy, and the farmer is happy to do that. But in the end, he wants to see more production. So there should always be a link between ET information from remote sensing and the impact on that production. Uh, so if you can show that by having a better information on ET, more timely irrigation, better soil moisture management, your production goes up, yeah, and then uh, you have a good story. Uh, so um, yeah, to summarize your question, um, I think it's very important that um, we work now on the next step to reach out to farmers, and try to use existing networks of irrigation advisory services and consultants. Uh, let them also guide the farmers uh, and uh, let's take care. The images are there on time, but also that the price is very affordable. Um, they are okay to pay something. Even in India, you know, they are very happy to pay some uh, a few hundred uh, rupees uh, for a hectare. That is not the issue, uh, but they should really should get very clear instructions. On, on what to do. That, that is, uh, I would say, my, my main response to your uh, question. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bastiansen, uh, for uh, your talk and uh, highlighting the importance of telling farmers what to do and not only share with them uh, ET maps that they don't know how to make use of. And telling them what to do at the right time is really very important. And the importance, of course, of the convergence of the different platforms together uh, in order to make better use of the data that is available uh, for the farmers. I'm sure that our audience will also have questions for you. So now I'll go to our next uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Daniela Zakaria. Uh, Daniela Zakaria holds a master's degree in land and water resources management from the International Center of, for Advanced Med Mediterranean Agronomic Studies. Institute of Bari, Italy, and holds a PhD in civil, environmental, in civil and environmental engineering from the Irrigation Engineering Division obtained from Utah University of the United States. Uh, during his career, he has been actively involved in applying research and in the formulation and execution of international cooperation projects in several Mediterranean, Middle Eastern, North African, Central Asian countries with a focus on water resources management and irrigation. Uh, Mr. Zakaria is currently an associate professor in agricultural water management for UC Cooperative Extension, Department of Land, Air, and Water Resources at the University of California, Davis. And his experience uh, and current work uh, uh, focuses on irrigation management under limited impaired water supplies determination of crop evapotranspiration and water productivity, and on, developing, and on developing viable agricultural water management solutions to improve resource efficiency in irrigated agriculture. Uh, Dr. Zakaria, you are an associate professor in agricultural water management, and you are very much involved in several challenges related to water resources management in California, uh, which, uh, which has recently exposed to several droughts. So can you provide us with some examples of water management issues you have addressed um, in California and for which remote sensing would be of help? And if encountered difficulties in its application, can you elaborate more on this, please? Thank you, and the, the floor is yours, Dr. Rizek. Thank you so much for having me today here. I'm happy uh, to join this uh, um, event and to attend the presentation by Pasquale. Uh, yes, uh, we uh, experience um, several uh, um, uh, several 
um, situation in California in the last few years. Uh, and I have a few examples that I would like to talk about. The first one is related to water transfer and water trading. Um, in the Central Valley of California, we have a quite complex water system uh, where the available surface water supply is uh, uh, somehow accumulated as a snowpack in the northern and central Sierra Nevada mountains. And then uh, when the snow melts, it generates surface runoff that is uh, somehow collected and stored in a number, in a high uh, number of uh, surface water reservoirs. From this reservoirs, then uh, water is uh, allocated and distributed to the different areas uh, according mainly to water rights entitlements. Um, the distri this uh, distribution of surface water supply based on, on, on water rights is pretty inequitable in California. And uh, as water rights holders that could be irrigation districts or water conservation agencies or farming corporation uh, normally have either insufficient or more than sufficient water uh, for, the com for their common areas. So there are uh, imbalances, so water availability, and those uh, become uh, pretty pronounced during either normal water supply years or during drought years. And this somehow results in a, a large groundwater extraction to compensate these imbalances. Now, water transfer and water trading uh, uh, among the dif different uh, um, uh, hydrologic units are somehow emerging mechanisms that can partially balance uh, the inequities in surface water allocation and could help reduce the high pressure on aquifer in normal water supply years and, and uh, also in dry years. But that, this water transfer and trading have certain economic costs. Now, remote sensing of ET could be a, you know, very uh, uh, helpful for quantifying and mapping irrigation water demand. At the various time scale, and this is crucial to drive transfers and trading uh, of surface water supplies. Now, coupling remote sensing of ET with models or ground based data sets that to estimate crop year response to water. Uh, could also enable to appraise the cost effectiveness or economic uh, profitability of uh, water transfer and water trading for the different water actors. Uh, unfortunately, the level of accuracy, the uncertainties and errors of ET estimates uh, based on remote sensing models are the various the spatial and temporal scales and not being investigated or documented enough and are becoming of great concern for water actors and users for this specific application in moving water throughout the state uh, in space and time. Uh, the second example uh, concerned the groundwater management regulation that uh, was enacted, uh, was actually uh, issued in California in 2014 as a result of multiple years of drought. Um, this is a most stringent regulation, environmental regulation. It's called Sustainable Groundwater Management Act or SIGMA. Um, it imposes to limit groundwater pumping and use in agriculture production areas that lie on overdrafted aquifers. And the goal of Sigma is to pursue sustainable balance between natural aquifer recharge and water extraction. Now, there are many specialty crop production areas across the state of California where the enactment, enactment of Sigma will most likely reduce groundwater extraction between one and two acre feet per acre that corresponds to 3,000 to 6,000 cubic meter per hectare. Uh, while the current water extraction is much higher, it's more than double, it's between three and five acre feet per acre. That means between 9,000 and almost, and almost 16,000 cubic meter per hectare. Now, remote sensing based ET estimate in this case could be a great, of great help to determine the sustainable crop acreage for overdrafted groundwater basin, and at the same time help understanding what options are there to move water 
over uh, areas that lie on uh, uh, groundwater over extracted uh, basins. Um, many groundwater sustainability agencies in California uh, that the state uh, man mandated to establish for the implementation of SIGMA adopted a remote sensing based ET estimation model without a systematic analysis of accuracy, uncertainties, and errors. And now various stakeholders from the agricultural production industries uh, means uh, individual growers, crop consultant, irrigation uh, practitioners, and the regula regulatory community are very concerned about under and overestimate estimates of irrigation requirements that might result from the use of remote sensing based model without proper ground truthing and validation. There is a third example that I would like to talk about because it involves some research that uh, have been leading and uh, uh, involved in. Um, there's a, a, there are multiple water actors in California, growers, irrigation district, and resources conservation is, uh, districts that are frequently and increasingly requesting more in-depth information about the re reliability and accuracy of remote sensing based ET estimates, uh, especially right after Open ET has been launched last week, we received uh, you know, a number of questions by all these water actors. And this is specifically important for specialty crops that are grown under what we call non-standard conditions or when farmers use some specific farming practices. The examples of non-standard condition could be pistachio, for instance, grown on saline and saline sodic soil. And this corresponds to about 30% of the total pistachio acreage in California, or wine grapes vineyards grown on hillside areas with different slopes and aspects, or avocado orchards grown on the coastal areas where the mist and fog and clouds are relevant components of the water balance. Uh, example of specific farming practices uh, could be regulated depth irrigation for fruit quality purposes. That this is normally uh, a standard practice in processing tomato, wine grapes for quality, wines, almonds and pistachio as well as citrus. Oh, another example of specific farming practices are where winter cover cropping or mulching for soil health purposes is normally conducted. And this is, uh, uh, you know, covering pistachio, wine grapes, walnuts, processing tomato, and a bunch of other specialty crops. Now, soil health practices are being increasingly incentivized in California with financial contribution by state and federal agencies. Now, I've been conducting some work for quantifying discrepancies between ground-based ET measurements with eddy covariance and surface renewal and remote sensing based ET estimates for some of this crop for both water resources planning and allocation as well as for irrigation scheduling. Our, our recent, recent research work showed that remote sensing based model that use the residual of energy balance method have a hard, have a hard time determ determining with sufficient accuracy the parameter of sensible heat flux or H. Age. Uh, age becomes a very relevant under some specific condition like plant stress. And this can, can be either caused by high temperature or heat or water deficit for quality purposes or water excess uh, or salinity in the soil or sodicity where you have hypoxia and anoxia. As, as long as age increases, the accuracy of a remote sensing based estimate greatly decreases, generating large differences between ground based measurement and remote sensing estimate. And this large differences could be quantified between 25 and 40 percent at the daily and uh, bi weekly uh, time steps. So on the other, on the opposite case for models using reflectance base or thermal base, KC estimate the robustness and dependability of functional relations of vegetation indices versus KC and canopy temperature versus KC 
must, ba must be validated and documented for the specific condition in place for the target crops. As a conclusion, I have a few conclusive, conclusive remarks in two specific direction. Remote, the first direction is remote sensing based models must be intensively calibrated and validated with ground data prior to adoption and use with confidence. Hybrid approach that could combine the use of ground measurement parameters like age and remote sensing based estimates like net radiation and ground heat flux could be a viable solution to increase ET estimate at field at larger scales. And the second direction is that a solid and systematic analysis of uncertainties and errors should be conducted for various crop growing condition prior to deciding to adopt and use remote sensing based uh, models for ET estimate. I try to uh, uh, put together all my thoughts on this regards in, in, uh, uh, in, in, in this consideration. I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Zakaria, for your intervention. And thank you for highlighting the water transfer and supply challenges we face at California and the inequalities and imbalances associated when it comes to water allocation, and also highlighting the importance of using remote sensing, taking into consideration, I'm underlining this, uh, taking into consideration the uncertainties uh, associated with remote sensing data sets and the, the, the importance of calibrating the different models, taking into consideration the different uh, uh, conditions for crop growing in the different regions. Thank you so much for your intervention. I think uh, that you will also have some questions from our audience. Now I'll move to our next panelist, uh, Ms. Nagla Elbenderi. Ms. Nagla Elbenderi holds a bachelor's degree in environment in, in civil engineering from Helwan University in Egypt, and holds a master's degree in irrigation from the Faculty of Engineering at Ain Shams University in Egypt. Uh, in her master's degree, she worked on rainfall and runoff modeling using remote sensing with data from the Eastern Nile watershed developing experience in hydrological modeling systems. Currently, she is doing her PhD studies at Ain Shams University, focusing on remote sensing determination of tobacco transpiration. Uh, Ms. Nagla has more than 15 years of experience in GIS and remote sensing, and more than five years of experience in water resources, water accounting, and ET estimation using remote sensing. Uh, she used to work at the Ministry of Water and Resources and Irrigation, as the head of the water accounting unit, and she is currently a national project coordination coordinator for the FAUCIDA project for Egypt. Um, Engineer Nagla, you have been leading the establishment of the water accounting unit at the Ministry of the Water Resources in Egypt, and this has been a unique example and a very advanced development within the ministry. To, to carry out the water accounting, I'm sure you have experienced uh, Use, uh, you, have, you, have exp you, you, uh, you have made extensive use of remote sensing ET data sets. So can you brief us or tell us what were the main challenges and difficulties and the lessons learned in the relation to the use of remote sensing ET when it comes to your water accounting applications there at the ministry? Thank you and over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, I'd, uh, first, I'd thank uh, FAO for intensive uh, webinars and the useful webinars for all of us. Uh, as uh, Dr. Pasquale mentioned, this, uh, uh, this webinar is available online and offline, so we can back to it uh, when we are free and see the recorded uh, uh, webinars. Uh, regarding to your questions, um, in the Ministry of Water Resources and Irrigation, uh, the, the Ministry uh, has a, a water accounting unit, and this unit, uh, uh, based on uh, in their applications and the analysis based on remote sensing data, especially evapotranspiration, and we already faced a lot of challenges related to, um, let me uh, categorize this uh, challenge into section two, two categories. Uh, the first one is the globally, which related to resolutions of data uh, and the scale, uh, temporal and uh, uh, temporal and uh, special scale or resolutions. Uh, all of us have a concern about the resolution of available data, even the free data. 
the most most probable data in evaporative conservation is the vapor data with 100 meter in a, a national level. Uh, so this data is not fit um, the studies or uh, analysis we did. As, uh, and the other thing is the accuracy assessment for this data. Uh, as we mentioned in the presentations and uh, with the panelists, uh, the measurement from the field data is, uh, uh, we have a lack of this measurement data. So we have to uh, increase the network for uh, measurement to uh, uh, validate or uh, calibrate the evapotranspiration product, different product. Uh, the other concern here in Egypt about the land uh, uh, land uh, consolidation, the, whole, the stakeholder of the land is small stakeholders. Uh, so the evapotranspiration product with this, this scale 100 meter is not fit with the Egyptian case. Uh, because of uh, small uh, stakeholders um, and the different crop. So uh, I think we have to uh, uh, also to uh, go to the policies uh, in the agriculture sector uh, to uh, make something like uh, crop zoning or land consolidation uh, to enhance the accuracy of crop uh, of evapotranspiration uh, products. <clears throat> we also in the, in the water accounting unit faced a lot of uh, problems related to evapotranspiration uh, the misleading data over the uh, different location, like uh, the bare the soil uh, locations, where we have uh, wrong or misleading data regarding to evapotranspiration. So I think we have to um, find a way to uh, solve or fix these problems related to bare soil uh, adjacent to agricultural land and the water bodies re uh, adjacent also to agricultural land. Um, I think also. <clears throat> Uh, we have uh, some problems with the models. We have to test more than just models. We already used the um, a free uh, available data uh, for evapotranspiration. So we have to use other uh, models and other products to uh, validate it in, in, the, in the Egyptian case uh, and see what is the proper model or the suitable model for the Egyptian case. Um, and I think we also have to develop our own uh, uh, product or, or our own model to uh, develop the evapotranspiration over Egypt. Uh, I think I covered the questions. Uh, if any question uh, with the audience or panelists, it's okay. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you so much, uh, Engineer Nagla, for highlighting uh, the challenges associated with the, the, res the resolution of the data in terms of spatial and temporal uh, uh, aspects and the accuracy assessment of the remote sensing ET in comparison to field measurements, and the importance, of course, of and the need to have finer resolution data sets to fit the field sizes in Egypt and other uh, developing countries where field sizes are uh, smaller than other in other countries. Um, I'm sure that you will be having also questions from the audience. I'll move right now to Dr. Ajit. Uh, Dr. Ajit has a bachelor degree in agricultural sciences from TNA University in India. He holds a master's degree in agricultural physics from IAR Institute in India and a PhD in agro in uh, eco-hydrological and biogeochemical modeling from the University of Toronto in Canada. He has developed expertise in environmental physics working in areas such as uh, boundary layer meteorology, uh, eco-hydrological modeling of carbon and water cycles, physics of remote sensing in optical, thermal, microwave, and multi-angular domains, canopy, radiative transfer modeling, and soil physics. He has been working with several international organizations and programs, including the French National Institute of Agricultural Research, FluxNet Canada, and America Flux in the United States. Currently, he is working as a cardiac -like a climatologist based in Egypt, where he is responsible for the climate research initiative in the dry land context of the Middle East and North Africa, Central Asia, India, and China. Uh, he's a member of the ICARDA team working on developing and managing an evapotranspiration field monitoring network in the NENA region with the support of the FAO Regional Water Scarcity Initiative and the WEPS project. Uh, Dr. Ajit, my question to you uh, as extended, as you have extended experience on monitoring the mass and energy exchange processes within the atmospheric boundary layer and evapotranspiration in particular, 
So in, in your view, what is still missing in remote sensing determination of PT that needs to be addressed to achieve full success in the application of remote sensing for ET? Uh, Dr. Ajit, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, good morning, all of you. And uh, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, FAO for this uh, fantastic uh, work, uh, especially Pascal has brought together the body of knowledge in remote uh, in ET discrimination, you know, from a remote sensing perspective, and also uh, the FAO team involved in the SIDA project. Uh, on the water scarcity initiative, which is extremely important in the context of climate change in a region which is extremely already dry and it is vulnerable to climate change. And uh, evapotranspiration is one of the critical element of the water balance and addressing um, evapotranspiration is the need of the hour in order to adapt to climate change. It is uh, not only an important issue in the MENA region, but also in several other parts of the world. For example, I am coming from a place where the annual precipitation is around 5,000 millimeters. Uh, it is extremely humid. Still, when we do agriculture, we do irrigate. So uh, evapotranspiration is very important and uh, it is uh, nice to have um, to be involved in this. So uh, my the question that was, uh, uh, posed to me is uh, what are the current limitations of uh, remote sensing based uh, ET retrievals and what could be some of the improvement areas. And uh, um, I, I come from a background of uh, modeling remote ET and other ecohydrological process from a water balance pers perspective. And uh, um, we have to first of all understand that when we talk about remote sensing of, uh, of ET, it is not directly uh, uh, directly obtained from remote sensing, but using remote sensing, we retrieve some of some specific land surface parameters such as NDVI or land surface temperature or NSVT, then go for a comprehensive modeling exercise. So it is essentially a spatial modeling activity. So to understand the process and uh, understand the limitations that we could address of ET retrieval using remote sensing based modeling, we have to, I think my view is, can be categorized into several aspects. First of all, let's uh, analyze the, from an alg algorithm point of view. Uh, we have seen that uh, we have uh, the energy balance approach where we assume that uh, evapotranspiration or latent heat flux is the residual of the net radiation and uh, ground heat flux and other components uh, may be there, like storage of heat in the, in the vegetation. Uh, then we have uh, another approach where uh, Pascual has already the, uh, done a comprehensive uh, analysis, but the issues that we have in these approaches uh, could be based on our algorithms itself. Like uh, there could be improvements in uh, algorithms where the E3 mechanism could be further improved. For example, if we, if we adopt a component modic equation in the E3 retrieval process, some of the uncertainties could be uh, addressed. For example, in the energy balance approach, we only have implicitly the, the vapor pressure deficit factor. That is also a driving force for evapotranspiration. Most of our assumption is that temperature is the driver for sensible heat flux and, uh, and also uh, the amount of vegetation is the proxy for the ground heat flux. So, um, uh, so addressing some of the algorithmic aspects can help, but most importantly, uh, as I mentioned that remote sensing of ET is uh, fundamentally determined by the retrieval of some biophysical parameters which are subjected to uh, um, further modeling. So that uh, boils down to the fact that we have to work more on the physics of remote sensing. Uh, some uh, in the case of land surface uh, uh, thermal domain, we are still uh, not yet mature or not yet uh, advanced in the physical aspects of retrieving 
the various uh, uh, parameters of the land surface in, in different wavelength domains, be it optical, be it thermal or microwave. Uh, for example, uh, the estimation of the accurate estimation of land surface emissivity and land surface temperature is still an open question in remote sensing cases. Uh, for example, uh, the, we are still not, the research uh, community is still not uh, sure on how, what, are, what is the directional anisotropy of the thermal uh, spec, thermal in the thermal domain. We, don't, we still don't know what is the canopy radiative transfer mechanism uh, of thermal domain. We have some advanced in optical domain, but not in thermal domain and microwave domain. So we don't know how the electromagnetic radiation of the sun goes through complex canopies like uh, uh, tall canopies and uh, canopies that have patchiness like olive orchards and things like that. So that is one thing. Um, then we could also integrate different uh, domains of remote sensing into our retrievals. For example, we have been mostly working on optical and thermal domains. Uh, I, um, Pascal has introduced the ET uh, look where the microwave domain has been introduced into the retrieval of soil much that can uh, constrain the uh, evapor actual evapotranspiration retrieval. So, uh, that is a very positive uh, signal, and uh, um, and this type of multi data fusion is very much needed for the hour in order to further improve each year retrievals. Um, then, um, um, what about uh, uh, some things related to the technological advancements? Uh, we have nowadays uh, platforms such as Google Earth Engine, where we have a uh, a, health, a, a wealth, huge wealth of remote sensing products and allied products that we could use. But that also um, brings another issue like how these uh, data products are uh, corrected, atmospherically corrected, because uh, if we are talking about remote sensing retrieval of uh, various biophysical parameters, the fundamental thing is to have a very accurate uh, reflectance atop of the canopy, not top of the atmosphere. So. Or do we have a very good uh, mechanism of atmospheric correction? Because something is between the canopy and the and the satellite, so atmospheric correction is extremely important. Uh, then some of the um, um, elements that uh, our uh, learner speakers before presented, uh, uh, Nagla, Dr. Nagla mentioned about the patchiness of uh, uh, land surface uh, or patchiness of the farms in. Uh, many developing countries, uh, which is very small, that boils down to the fact that we need very high resolution sensors. Uh, so thermal remote sensing is, thermal remote sensor products are still not very uh, high resolution in terms of the spatial, spatial resolution as well as uh, temporal resolution. So that is one area where uh, res or research and policy, the space policy needs to advance. Uh, then um, uh, um, Dr. Daniel mentioned very, very important point uh, about California, where micro meteorological issues are there that could uh, complicate the E3 retrievals. This is very, very important because uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, this ET product has to be used by an end user that is uh, subject to, to micro meteorological conditions. So this boils down to the fact that we need to have high resolution, high accurate weather products. So um, now I think uh, most of the time we uh, in the E3 retrieval, be it a, a spatial explicit modeling with the full water balance or using remote sensing based ET products or in all these approaches, we need to have high resolution weather products. And I think 70 to 80% of the ET biophysics is controlled by weather. So even if we have very accurate or very high precision, high precision land surface products obtained from remote sensing, if the weather parameters are still not accurate, uh, we may still be uh, having a bias in our EP estimation. So we need to have high resolution, high accurate, and near real time weather products. This uh, means we need to have. Uh, 
sophisticated weather prediction, weather forecasting, or we need to advance satellite meteorology. Uh, satellite meteorology. So that means uh, like uh, Meteosat, where products, meteorological products are available. Not only the land, we have advanced so much in land surface remote sensing, but not in atmospheric remote sensing and other aspects of remote sensing. So those products can be brought in uh, to increase the accuracy of remote sensing uh, retrievals. And uh, Dr. Wim mentioned a very, very important point in the, that um, what, is, uh, what is it all about? And at the end of the day, we have to advise to the farmer and uh, in, in, in usable, uh, as usable advisory. So we have to translate the ET into some advisories um, that could be taken up by the farmer for operational use. This is one of the most critical element and uh, one uh, that we have to address. And uh, this is a good platform to discuss that. And uh, um, one point I missed, uh, yeah, we are mostly talk talking about ET from an irrigated perspective, irrigated agriculture perspective. So do we need ET, ET products for rainfed farming? This is a question or other, other types of uh, agriculture like agro-pastoral systems or uh, pristine ecosystems. I think yes, because uh, ET is not, not only used for irrigation, but also it can be used as a predictor for the, for the, for the status of crop, even in rainfed systems. So, if, uh, if, a, if, if a rain for crop is uh, in, uh, having a high ET, that means it is performing well and we can expect a higher yield at the end of the season. So it is not only relevant to irrigated farming, but also rain for agriculture. So I think um, with this, I would like to wrap up and uh, um, I will be very happy to uh, take your questions if there are any. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ajit, uh, for highlighting the crucial elements that need to be addressed in order to have the remote sensing ET more beneficial to the end users uh, at the end of the day. Uh, we've reached the, the final section of the technical session. I want to give the floor to my colleague, Simon, in order to present the different questions that we have uh, uh, received from the audience in the chat box. So Simon, I'll give the floor for, to you to address the question to our dis distinguished guests. Thank you and over to you, Simon. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, so the first question is from Wakas Karim Awan about model suitability for the Indus Basin irrigation system on real-time basis in Punjab, Pakistan. And he has provided some characteristics in the basin as a complex climate conditions, mixed crop patterns, a few areas of 30 to 40 percent uh, cloud cover annually, and few areas having mostly a dry year. So maybe he's asking about which model is more suitable, and in these conditions. Uh, I think um, Wim, you may also answer to this question because I spontaneously would say. Uh, you have been using actually ET look in that region. And, and that was one of the, uh, let's say, most uh, performing, well performing approach. So you might want to elaborate on that one. Yeah, thank you, Pasquale. Um, indeed, I have been working uh, in Pakistan with different types of models. So um, I have been using models like Seaball um, for, uh, let's say, limited regions, uh, like one distributary canal uh, or at field level, wherever we looked at 30 meter pixels and 10 meter pixels, which is good. Uh, why is that good? Because then you can link up uh, easily, more easily with the field work uh, that uh, also Danielle and Ajit were referring to, uh, that you really would like to always compare with local measurements. Now, Unfortunately, there are not many flux towers in Pakistan, but nevertheless, you know, you have people doing great soil water balances, you know, and, and that is uh, useful by itself. So um, if you want to have more uh, local validation, I think you should use models like, like CBAL and, and metric and so on. Now, 
His question is about Indus Basin, okay? Indus Basin is big. And I know that he's working for the Punjab Irrigation Department and Wakas can say himself, but I think he has to cover 8 million hectares every day, okay? You cannot run, you cannot run uh, all these models that you nicely um, elaborated, Pasquale, for such an 8 million hectare. Eh? So in that case, you really have to go to the ET look kind of models that are also the basis for WAPOR, eh? because that is scalable. Eh? So here comes also the issue, which is scalable and which one is not. Uh, and uh, uh, because there are always, every model has its assumptions. So some of these models, they have an assumption on constant meteorological conditions. Now, if you go to a larger area, these meteorological conditions are not constant. Yeah, so that means that you have to go to another type of model. Uh, so um, my, my suggestion to Wakas is that uh, he should work at three scales at the same time. So one is the field measurements, then he should validate that with, let's say, typically field scale uh, energy balance models and use that then to look at the uh, models that you can use for upscaling to in this space. And so it's like, a, I, would, I would suggest a stepwise uh, uh, approach to such kind of condition. And I think his question is relevant because if you start with the wrong model, yeah, then you have over expectations and you know the model will never meet your expectations and so it's good that somewhere you know we we you know we make this summary of models and suitabilities clear and of course this helps the seminar helps but let me take also the opportunity here to say that irrigation uh, FAO has this great irrigation and drainage papers the most cited hydrological paper in the world is FAO 56 uh, why don't you make an FAO uh, paper on, uh, on these kind of things that you're discussing? Huh? On what kind of models are there? What do you advise for which kind of scale? That really helps agencies like an irrigation department in Pakistan. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the first question is from the panelist, Daniele Zakaria, and maybe it's addressed to you, Pasquale. Uh, which is aren't Fluxnet towers located on various surfaces and not specifically on agricultural surfaces? Yeah, that that's uh, is uh, is true in the sense that the majority are in fact in a forest area because the original idea of the uh, Fluxus uh, tower was uh, for the climate change and CO two exchange. However, over time they've been adding some on rangeland and some agricultural crops. The point is that that is only to test and uh, on the same surface, how they go. Uh, but then you, if you want a, an agricultural crop, I think you need to have the tower on your crop. That was only an idea that most of the global models tend to, to use available data, and this is one of them. And they go on the same surface. But you are right that there is a lack of uh, monitoring of data on the specific surface of interest, tree crops, ranch lands, like Ajit also mentioned, and so on. Thank you, Pasquale. The third question is from uh, Domiti Valet to Wim, saying that since many farmers do not have control on the water supply, uh, especially when part is uh, centrally managed or se are centrally managed irrigation system schemes. How do we inform the managers of those irrigation schemes to have a demand drive or demand driven supply using the ET based information? Yeah, thank you, Domitil. That's a very interesting question. Um, because when we speak about this remote sensing ET, um, we always dream that farmers have water on demand available and they can switch the, the tap when they want. And that is certainly not true uh, in South Asia. And I think that is also where you are referring to. Um, what I have experienced is that uh, although there is always what they call an intent, you know, there's like an, 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 a certain volume of water being allocated for the season, even by eight day intervals, more and more organizations want to know whether that is right. And there's a very simple reason for that because water is getting scarcer. Snow is melting eh, in the Himalayas. So all these big reservoirs in Pakistan and India, you know, they have, an, uh, they have an, uh, a challenge, so to speak. So although 
there is a seasonal planning. I see now more and more organizations that really want to check, well, is my eight day intent of water, is it correct? And shall I perhaps modify and adopt? And, uh, and that's a good thing. Huh? And then uh, we have to help them. Now, uh, if you do planning, you always look ahead. You want to look eight days ahead and so on. Now, Ajit spoke about numerical weather prediction models. And that's a very good point. You know, one of this big problem of weather prediction models is that they have no irrigation. So there is no irrigation in India. There is no irrigation in Pakistan, the two biggest countries in the world on irrigation. And of course, then your air temperature and your humidity simulations are just, just nonsense. You know, they don't, they don't even make sense. I, uh, even California has no irrigation in those models. And I checked and actually the temperature is wrong by two, three, four degrees. Uh, so anyway, my point here is that um, we, we, for planning of irrigation, you have to use weather models, but in conjunction with images on ET. And I think by using the latest ET images, Domitil, I think we can always see like, hey, are we in line with the, with the plan? And if we are not, then, you know, organizations should be willing to change. That's another thing. Uh, are they willing to change? My observation is that they are more and more willing. And uh, one very concrete example, um, all many organizations in the world use the crop coefficients from FAO. Why? because nobody debates them. You know, if somebody's using FEO crop coefficient, then you're covered, okay? But then you take lentils, whatever, you know, or uh, oil seeds, and it says the crop coefficient has to be 0 0.6. But if you see that from the images that the crop coefficient is not 0 0.6, but it is 0 0.4, you know, you can really save water. And I, I think really that more and more planning organizations are very open-minded to also then do this kind of checking. And so I, I think that even a day rotations can be improved by looking at those um, remotely sensed ET data. Thanks. Uh, thank you. We have a question from Zaibun Nisa to Dr. Pasquale asking how confidently current RS-based ET can be used for water allocation in farming systems on real-time basis. On real-time basis, sorry? On real-time basis. On real-time, okay, basis, not basis, sorry. Uh, it, I don't know, it, this is difficult to say, but the Erie Watch, for instance, is one of those examples that daily, they provide information to the farmers, and it seems that the daily approach already uh, helps to take a decision on the real time. Sometimes you would like to go below the, the daily, but uh, generally speaking, there are. I mean, you can adjust to the daily uh, basis, um, you know, information for irrigation. It's a question of understanding better the, the scales also the spatial scales of the farm in order to go uh, properly in that direction. But if the farm is uh, like a commercial, large enough uh, to suit the, the minimum uh, uh, spatial scale of the satellites, then you might also go to the uh, daily, you know, uh, time scale, but provided the Again, the uncertainty and the accuracy of what it takes to get that daily data is uh, uh, appropriate for that purpose. Thank you, Pasquale. We have also a question from Zaibu Nisa to you, asking if data will be accessible for the NINA region after the launch of the new ET-based satellite mission in the future. And uh, after these satellite products, do we still need to depend on ET models? Okay, so the new, let's say, mission like the Hydrosat that will be a constellation of satellites that will be launched in 2024, uh, supposedly is to be open, but this is a consortium, I think, also with the private. So 
what will be the policy for accessing this data, we don't know yet, but the theoretical or in principle should be like that. Now, we, that's our uh, constellation of satellites measuring land surface temperature. So still with the same problem of cloud and so on, we still will depend, of course, on ET models. Maybe it will be by the time there will be an evolution, further improvement, but of course, the satellites provides just the data of land surface temperature, other information uh, on, uh, you know, on the spectral uh, resolution. But in terms of algorithms, you still have to do that processing. Thank you. Uh, another question is from Ihab Juma to Ajit. Uh, do you believe that RS should complete ground measurements of ET instead of thinking to replace ground measurements up to this date? Sorry, can you please repeat it? I couldn't hear it. Yes. So the question is whether do you believe that RS ET uh, should complete ground measurements of ET instead of replacing uh, ground measurements? No, no, absolutely not. Because uh, more, you know, models are models. It is never in a complete uh, of the reality. It's, um, so models will help us to uh, understand the complexity of nature, and it helps us to plan, and it helps us to. But um, but I would I would uh, I would never agree that uh, model based ET approaches should be uh, should replace the ground measurements. Every uh, we definitely need to have ground measurements for um, for validating the um, ET products and also to train them eventually because these uh, sites which we measure. Uh, evapotranspiration, they not only really measure evapotranspiration, but a whole lot of meteorological variables, including uh, net radiation and uh, humidity and soil moisture. All these things, things could be used collectively to understand the process of, of uh, uh, the system. Um, now, you may ask me if, uh, if ET product is validated um, for one of one or few years using ground measurements, should we continue ground measurements for that site or not? Definitely, still you may have to continue because under different climate uh, climatic situations, the, uh, the 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 if you understand if you see the under underlying algorithms, the the way these variables are non-linearly changing with changes in a uh, variable mag magnitudes of various parameters. Uh, this can create uh, the ET very much differently. So I think under different climatic situations, under different management situations, under different uh, crop situations, so the, the, the ET retrievals may change further. So I think it's a good idea to uh, keep on the measurements going and also establish newer uh, sites of uh, measurements and also newer methods of measurement. So I think uh, that's very, very important to have continued. And uh, one point I missed during my intervention was that there is still a room for improvement in upscaling instantaneous remote sensing products to daily time step. That is a, a gray area. And, uh, and Pasquale has indicated during his presentation. And there is a lot of room for uh, improving our each retrievals if you uh, specifically observe that area. Thank you very much. Sorry for interrupting you. The session has been very much uh, fruitful, and uh, every, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the audience have many questions that we haven't addressed. So we will be trying to address them and send them to the Cairo Water Week. Um, I'm sorry for having to close the session. Now I'll give the floor to Dr. Vinay Nanjia, the research leader, soil, water, and agronomy at ICARDA, for the closing remarks. And we hope we'll see you in, in 30 minutes at the measured uh, and remote sensing based ET determinations in the following session, inshallah. Today. Thank you, and over to you, Dr. Nanji. Well, thank you so much, Mohammed, and thank you so much, FAO, for organizing the session.
as well as I want to congratulate you for the wonderful webinar series that, that you have run uh, under the leadership of Pasquale and uh, the Near East uh, uh, FAO office. So uh, ICARDA has been part of this series from the start. I remember moderating the inaugural session and we have been part of this and we are proud of that. And also we have a FAO uh, uh, funded uh, ET regional um, network of measuring ET. And we are hoping that we will have a regional data set of, of data to have a, a, a map, a, a plot, a graph similar to what uh, Pasquale presented for the 32 years. We will have something similar for the region to present soon. And uh, the webinar series has been very timely, very informative, and how Pasquale summarized it in his uh, keynote speech was marvelous. Like everybody commented uh, through the chat as well as uh, uh, the, the, the panelists uh, commented, he has captured the key messages very well. And this, this presentation can be even a landmark reference uh, for, for people in the future. And uh, ET measurement, through remote sensing is important, especially for large areas, especially for this dry area that we are working in, uh, because a uh, large portion of the fresh water, almost 75, 85% of the fresh water is used for agricultural food production. And uh, it's, it's important to have a good handle on, on the evapotranspiration amounts that, that we're losing. Uh, so Pasquale touched upon the strengths, weaknesses, fit for purpose, the error analysis, the uncertainty, all these things were very informative. I'm, I'm sure the audience benefited immensely from it. And uh, it's, it's pleasing to hear that the FAO office for Near East and North Africa will be leading this uh, regional technical platform on water scarcity. And this is a recognition of the good work that the Water Scarcity Initiative is doing. And uh, I congratulate Dr. Alhamdi and the whole team as well as all the partners involved in the Water Scarcity Initiative that have been providing such good uh, research uh, opportunities for the people, as well as generating these international public goods. With that, I would like to conclude the session and thank you everyone for staying with us for this long and for enriching the discussion. The panelist, uh, uh, panel discussion, I enjoyed a lot. I, I think uh, it was very informative and, and people enjoyed listening to the, the four panelists. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you in 30 minutes in the next uh, session that complements this session. Thank you.